Welcome to the Bluffton Biblecast, where together we embark on an apocalyptic adventure through the prophets and revelation. Though it's a daunting task, we encourage you to embrace the challenge and find captivating truths from the mysterious parts of God's Word. Thanks for joining us as we study my favorite minor prophet. The next book we're going to read is Habakkuk. Or as some say, Habakkuk. Yes, (laughs) I'm just going to call him Habby for our use today. According to the Bible Project, which is where I got my summary information on this, this book of the Bible is a compilation of the prophet's laments. Habby questions God's goodness because he sees so much injustice, evil, and tragedy in the world. And I feel like I can sometimes relate to this with the world we live in today. The events described in the book of Habakkuk take place in Judah, Babylon, and Egypt before the Babylonian siege and subsequent exile. Well, that is helpful to know. So what do you think is... Habby's first complaint, (laughs) besides the fact that he now sounds like a giant panda. In verses 2 through 4, he complains that life in Israel is horrible. The Torah is neglected, resulting in violence and injustice, and all of it is being tolerated by Israel's corrupt leaders. Habby is crying out, asking God to do something, but nothing is changing. I appreciate Habby's honesty with God. Me too. In verses 5 through 11, God responds, saying that he is aware of the deep corruption among his covenant people and that he's summoning the armies of Babylon to bring justice down on rebellious Israel. Similar to the message of Micah and Isaiah, God says that he will use this terrifying empire to devour Israel because of their injustice and evil. I'm assuming that's not what Habby wanted to hear. Right. I don't think he liked that answer either. He offers up his second complaint, starting in verse 12. Babylon, he says, is even worse than Israel. They are even more violent and corrupt. They deified their own military power and treat humans like animals, gathering them up like fish in a net. They devour nations and people groups to further build their empire. Habi asks, how can such a holy, good, and just God possibly use such corrupt people as his instruments in history? Which seems like a familiar question that both believers and unbelievers alike tend to ask God from time to time. Chapter 2 is God's answer to Habakkuk's question. (laughs) Well, what is it? His answer is, arguably, the most famous passage in the whole book. What is it? Well, first, God tells Hubby to write down a vision because it's coming at an appointed time. He must be patient and wait for it. Okay, what is it? Patience. Okay, go ahead and read it. It's in verse 4. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Okay, I see the famous quote, just shall live by his faith, but I'm not sure how this answers the question as to why God uses corrupt people to judge others. Well, let's ponder that from another angle. Here's a question. Does God wait until people are perfect before using them? (laughs) No. If God only used perfect people, he would have no one to use. I agree. So consider the history of the Israelites. They certainly weren't perfect when God used them to judge the people of Canaan. Abraham, David, Saul, none of them were perfect. Okay. Yes, God uses imperfect people to do his will, but... In the rest of chapter 2, God delivers a series of five woes against unrighteous people, such as the Babylonians. God will punish them. Okay, God uses people, even wicked people, to perform his will. And at some point, God will punish the wicked. What does this have to do with the just living by faith? Great question. Let's call an expert. I call Apostle Paul to the witness stand. Please read Romans 1, verses 16 through 19. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Notice how Paul contrasts living by faith with those who suppress truth in unrighteousness. Just like Habakkuk. Paul says that God will judge the wicked who do not live in the truth. Okay, so living by faith is a lifestyle, not a one-time decision. It's a life that understands that God has been faithful in the past 
And so he will be faithful in the future. That's wonderful. Yeah. With Paul's thinking in mind, let's return to Habakkuk. I get it. Habby asks, God, how can you use Babylon to judge us? God answers by saying that he will ultimately judge all wickedness and his followers are to trust that God is working everything out. In short, they live by faith. That's beautiful. And listeners, if you want to study this further, I encourage you to check out Galatians 3, in which Paul once again uses Habakkuk 2.4 to make his point. Speaking of chapter 3, what does Habby chapter 3 have for us? It's a good summary of God's faithfulness in the past, a key ingredient for living by faith. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, so it's poetry, so you have to think a little bit about it. So I'll tell you what, I'll read it, and you tell the listeners what historical event it's most likely alluding to. Okay, let's go. Verse 5, before him went pestilence, and fever followed at his feet. Pestilence, that sounds like the plagues of Egypt. I agree. How about this? Verse 8, O Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? That's a little more difficult, but the last one was about Egypt, and this mentions the sea. Maybe this is about the Red Sea? Yes, there's probably a lot of ways to go about this, but it does seem to resemble the Red Sea crossing. Anything else? Let's bring this to a close. Here are verses 17 through 18. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines... Though the labor of the olive may fail, and the field yields no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I'll rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Wow, that is quite a picture of living by faith. Even if the world falls apart around Tabby, he rejoices in the Lord. Okay, before we continue on, who's ever going to be preaching the week that we do this, I encourage you, use Habby over the pulpit. (laughs) I just want to hear what happens. All right, Darren, now we got that out of the way. Complete this cliche. Those who don't learn from the past are... Going to fail history class? Well, actually, yeah, that's true. But according to the actual cliche, those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. Or, to borrow from the author of Psalm 78, those who do not learn from the past are doomed to be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that not set their heart aright, and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This author, which the subscript in probably most Bibles identifies as Asaph, reviews much of the history of Israel, and he doesn't flinch. He recalls the times they tested God in the wilderness, for instance, and I assume verses 60 through 66 refer to the account of In 1 Samuel 4, when the Israelites arrogantly assumed they could use the Ark to conquer the Philistines, or as the Phillies is how we're going to call them. (laughs) And if I can recall correctly, the Phillies conquered Israel, killed the priest Eli's sons, and took the Ark. Correct. Hmm. So out of curiosity, do we know whatever happened to the Ark? Great question. The Bible doesn't say, but we know the Israelites didn't include it in the temple they built after they returned from the exile. Many, at least some, conclude the Babylonians took it or destroyed it when they captured Jerusalem. Okay, if so, then it shows the Israelites at the time didn't learn from history. God needed to punish them for their rebellion, particularly their idol worship, just like he punished the Israelites in the wilderness. Right. Exactly. But we must not only learn from the past, but we must also learn correctly. What do you mean? Well, by the time Jesus began his ministry, many of the Israelites had learned to take the law seriously. The Pharisees in particular so desperately wanted to avoid God's wrath and restore Israel's power, they applied the law with unprecedented zeal. So why does Jesus so often chastise the Pharisees? It seems like they try to avoid violating the law just like the Jews of the past did. On the surface, yes. I mean, they did apply it with zeal, but not out of a love and reverence for God and his holiness and righteousness. I don't even think they did it necessarily out of a godly fear. Instead, at the risk of oversimplifying, many, perhaps most of the Pharisees, simply wanted God to bless them again like he blessed the Israelites years ago. Essentially, God became a means to an end. I see. So they didn't commit adultery like the Israelites during the day of the prophet Habakkuk, but they still missed the point of the law and God's intentions for it. I think so. And in doing so, they essentially turned the promised land and its blessings into idols, which did hinder their ability to believe in Jesus. How so? Well, in John 6, for example, 
a group of Jews in Capernaum or Cappy come to Jesus <laughs> after he feeds 5,000 men. Sorry, Becca, this is going to be your legacy. <laughs> so feeds 5,000 men, and they essentially demand that Jesus provide them manna in the wilderness like Moses did. Which I'll quickly add, Asaph highlights in Psalm 78. Yes, good connection. And the Jews of Jesus' time remembered that blessing, but I think they forgot or ignored its significance. God provided for their material needs, not simply so they could live comfortably and complacently. He told them that he provided manna to teach them not to live on bread alone, but by every word of God. Basically, he wanted to prepare people who would faithfully honor him through obedience once they arrived at the promised land. Certainly, he would bless them materially because he would serve a good God, but the blessings serve a greater purpose beyond just satisfying their material wants. Yeah, good thought. And at the risk of again oversimplifying, I think based on John 6 and similar accounts, many of the Jews of Jesus' time basically wanted God's blessings more than they wanted God's glory or a relationship with him. Okay, I see. Had they kept the law the way God intended, had they truly learned from the past, they perhaps would have more readily embraced Jesus. Yes, and they would have more readily embraced promises greater than they could ever imagine. Thank you for the opportunity to walk alongside you while digging in deeper to the Word of God. We've really enjoyed learning more about His heart and ultimately His plan for all people. May God bless you as you enjoy this week's Bible reading. Thank you, thank you.